fluent and flowing. Um, but if you can add them into the chat box, which I'm sure people have used before, but it's down the bottom of your screen if you're on, on a computer or if you're on your phone, it is um, the three dots in the corner. And if you click on that, you can type in your question and we will be able to field them and um, ask Charlotte and Mary when appropriate. So um, yeah, and at the end, um, if we've got time, we'll also have a bit of question time as well. So feel free to ask as we go through and we will um, pass them on to Charlotte. Thanks guys. Yeah, so look, um, just on the questions bit, just to add my bit, if we, we do have a pretty tight time scale, so if we don't get to your questions, apologies for that, but we'll, we'll do the best we can. So look, um, just wanna quickly introduce uh, Charlotte Westwood uh, from PGG Rights and Seeds. Um, Charlotte's gonna talk to us about ill thrift at this time of year. So I'll, no further ado, I'll hand you over to Charlotte. Oh, thanks very much, Garth, and um, thanks to all the beef and lamb team for getting this organised, and most importantly, thanks for those of you who are joining us for this session. Well, it's certainly starting to feel more like autumn, so we thought that this topic uh, will hopefully be relevant to a number of you, um, you know, particularly across the geographical spread from Taranaki down to the, um, the top half of the South Island. So, Automobile thrift is one of these vague things that um, sometimes it's hard to put your finger on just what's going on, and... Oh, there we go. What's it about? So scene setting here, guys, is that essentially it's just when your stock aren't doing as well as uh, you would expect them to do at this time of year. And there's a lot of definitions about how poorly is poorly. Well, it's really about taking your expectations of what you've done in your best year and saying that perhaps for it may be for wiener cattle, it may be for uh, hoggets heading into the winter, that your live weight gain expectations are 30% or more lower than where you'd like them to be. So you might normally churn along at 200 grams on lambs uh, and they're only doing 130, 140. And so that seems to be a little bit of a cut point, a New Zealand um, centric cut point to set expectations by, but realistically it's quite subjective. And if you do feel that performance is not as good as it should be, you know, um, just everything looks off, cattle may be off in the coat, um, you know, a bit, of a bit of a dull, you know, look to the fleece. It can reflect a wide number of things, and I'm going to put a slide up it's just trying to explain how broad the causes are that can contribute to this. But with regard to my brief, um, yes, I am a registered veterinarian like Mary, but I'm going to leave her to do a lot of the heavy lifting on the animal health stuff, even though I am a vet, and focus more on the nutrition things that can contribute to it. So we'll cover some aspects of what happens as the quality of your pastures change, or quality and quantity, as we move from summer dry, dry pasture to, to more of your post-autumn flush, the first decent autumn rain of the, the year and how things change, and why the new and recovering pasture growth may in part, not always entirely, but in part contribute to lower than expected performance. So multiple things in, in play here, but I would encourage you, particularly where you have concerns with regard to presence of clinical disease uh, in your sheep and beef, that as always, webinars are not intended to replace the advice of your own vet. Uh, he or she will know your own farm, your stock, and your specific situation. So please do seek professional advice. So obviously, the motivation to try and identify what's causing automobile thrift and to do something about it is that clearly we end up with stock that may stand still or not perform well in the autumn. So then you're always chasing to play catch up on performance heading into winter when obviously things get more expensive and more difficult to keep animals lifting, both in terms of um, either life weight gain or perhaps ewe condition or whatever other metrics that you're trying to improve. So in many cases, we may see things like clinical coccidiosis, um, internal um, parasites uh, that we'll glance over very briefly today, or it just may be everything looks fine, but life weight gain is suboptimal. So you're ready for my crazy mind map on this of all the things that can potentially contribute to automobile thrift. And this is just my brain dump. So many of you uh, and Mary as well will have some other ideas, but this is what we're going to um, work on today for this lunchtime webinar. Firstly, we'll, we'll touch on, and I'll have, try and have a slide on each of these, initially feed budgeting. Uh, we can't get into the nitty gritty of feed quality and clinical issues uh, if it's a feed budget challenge, and it's sometimes difficult to, to get your feed budget just so, just right at this time of year. 
With regard to your summer pasture before things change with our autumn rains, this can obviously be quite poor depending on the type of season that we've had. And obviously the season's been all over the place from Taranaki down to the Upper South Islands. So each of you will have a, set, a specific set of circumstances. I'm going to touch briefly on the importance of stock water, both in terms of absolute supply of top stock water and also quality. This is, I guess, where we lean into the point around changing pasture quality. And with autumn break, um, rain comes a flush of feed, and we can see quite an abrupt change, uh, both in the dry matter percentage of pasture, but also aspects around crude protein and also fibre. So we'll come back to that in a moment. As well as that, then we move into some of what we'd term the anti-nutritionals. That may be the clinical or subclinical effects of facial eczema, mycotoxins and ryegrass endophyte alkaloids, which are the chemicals produced um, by the endophytes within ryegrass. So we'll come back to this. And um, last and by no means least, certainly internal parasites. Uh, clearly these topics are not in order of significance or importance. Uh, internal parasites, subclinical disease, move more, moving more into the animal health space as well, and trace mineral and also potentially vitamin deficits versus demand by animals and Mary's going to do an outstanding job of that uh, when I've stopped talking away so I look forward to your part Mary. So yeah feed, feed supply versus demand I mean feed budgets are like cash flow budgets they're just a necessary evil um, and there's no point me or Mary or other rural professionals that you work with talking about other things until we acknowledge the importance of feed budgeting. We do see um, a change feed supply post autumn break depending on of course how the summer has treated you and you know, for many areas, we've had not a bad summer in terms of feed supply, other years less so. So there is quite a, a change in demand. We may go from an absolute deficit through to a surplus in short time. Um, but when we start looking at outside of straight pasture growth rates, we can see issues with summer pasture post autumn rain. Uh, on the onset of rain, quite often a lot of the tag and the thatch that's present in your summer pasture actually decays and rots and your average pasture cover may drop um, two or even 300 kilograms dry matter average pasture cover if you have a lot of thatch non-green material present in summer pasture. So our feed budget, certainly when I run feed budgets, I never account for that, but it can see you go from a what's comfortably supply equaling demand into actually a small deficit after the autumn rains due to that dry matter loss. Another aspect around feed budgeting is that we mentioned before that the new growth contains a relatively low percentage of dry matter, more about that shortly. And to be fair to all of us, it's really easy to overestimate pasture mass on offer with autumn um, regrowth when you've got that lovely flush of green grass, the dry matter percent can be quite low. We think that there is a pasture mass of perhaps 1400 there, and there may only be 1000. We'll come back to that. So to be fair to all of us, we're only human. And it can be easy with that autumn flush to inadvertently underfeed stock. And you'll see that you may um, put a mob of lambs into a paddock and think there's three to four days feed in there. And, and actually they've bared it out after only a couple of days. So we'll move on to the rest of the aspects around nutrition and anti-nutritional bits and pieces. But yeah, we do need a conservative feed budget. They're boring. I hate running feed budgets. You hate running feed budgets, but it's a, it's a necessary evil if you'd like. And so obviously feed budgeting for those of you, you may be a junior shepherd, you know, just starting out, or you may be an experienced person who just hates spreadsheet based feed budgets. But look, there's a lot of good references out there. And if in doubt, um, just seek advice from um, perhaps um, someone on the same road as you that knows more about these things, uh, reach out to Beef and Lamb or, or other rural professionals. Feed budgeting is quite, quite fun and easy. When you, well, not fun, but quite easy. It it's just needs to be done. So that aside, leaving that behind, what are some of the potentially nutritionally related challenges as stock move into the autumn and, and why this may in part explain autumn ill thrift uh, after our autumn rains? Well, firstly, there's a change in quality of feed. And this diagram, I think, has been around since, I reckon, since when I went through uni. We've all seen it. And to be fair, you can't do away with it. Um, anyone new into the industry, it still captures, you know, the picture says a thousand words. And essentially this is for a 30 kilo lamb as an example of the impact of the megajoules, that's MJ, ME, megajoules of metabolizable energy on potential live weight gain. So the energy value um, 
is is uh, along the, the horizontal part and then potential live weight gain grams per head per day for 30 kilo lamb. So it's not unsurprising that as we get into the better quality feeds, uh, we potentially get better live weight gain. And, and the bestest, bestest thing is when a lamb is at foot and ewe milk, which is by far the highest ME in different calculations, will take that even as high as uh, 15 megajoules per um, kilogram dry matter of ewe milk. So it's an old one, it's a goodie, but autumnal thrift starts to confuse us a little when we say, but the autumn regrowth is very, very high. Why might sometimes young stock particularly suddenly stand still? And that's what we'll talk about. So in theory, early autumn pasture should be up here. And why do we not always see the lime, lamb live weight gains or calf uh, weaner or even our two live weight gains that we're looking for? So we'll come back to that in a minute. I'm just going to jump in and we briefly mentioned the importance of stock water. Now, even though I'm jumping around a bit, I make no apologies for it, but stock water is really important, but the requirement changes as we go from summer pasture through to autumn break or flush. So summer, summer pasture, I mean, that's just an abysmal looking pasture there in terms of quantity and quality, but the dry matter percent on summer pasture can get as high as 35 or even 40% dry matter. So our stocks requirement for water is much higher on that pasture than it is on the autumn flush, when all of a sudden that the autumn flush grass is chocker full of water and the stock water requirements drop. So dry matter um, percent being high in summer pasture, we have a much higher demand for stock water. And if we don't offer stock water when they're on these drier types of feed, it's the same as us sitting down this morning for breakfast with a bowl full of wheat picks. And I'll tell you what, you eat one dry wheat pix and I'm about done. That's going back to when I was a kid. I think we used to try those as trying to dare our mates of who could eat the most dry wheat picks. And it's pretty tough unless you put that milk on. So for stock to eat a lot of feed and not have a lot of water in these, and it's a dry feed, you will reduce the dry matter intake, the ability of that animal to consume feed. So thirsty stock, eat less feed, reduce feed conversion efficiency. That's what FCE is, feed conversion efficiency. And ironically, in late summer, early autumn, if you haven't yet got lush feed on hand, that will contribute to problems. So it could be an absolute lack of water, the old empty trough scenario, or that water is just disgusting to drink. So don't underestimate the importance of um, stock water in late summer, early autumn, while the grass or pasture is extremely dry. And just a wee reminder here is that within the 2018 Code of Welfare for Sheep and Beef Cattle, we're, as people in charge of animals, we are obligated to provide water to stock. Um, so just a wee reminder there. So for a range of reasons, it is important uh, to offer stock water. So coming back to the feed, and I've spent a number of years um, both studying and working in Australia, and there's, there's a fascinating condition that comes out of Western Australia with merinos called crazy running disease. It's a true story. You Google it, you should be able to find it. There's actually a paper, a scientific paper written on it. And what happens is that in the Mediterranean climate in Western Australia, coming out of a drought when feed is both scarce but also not a lot of green leaf on it, um, stock can chase that emerging green pick of feed. They're going, yum, at last I have green feed after a very dry summer. And what can happen is they, they can consume very little feed and yet walk a long way to chase that feed. So they're increasing the amount of time spent walking and grazing, increasing require, requirements for energy with that, and yet they're eating very little. So again, they can walk off condition in terms of body condition, and this can, can be associated with uh, ultra-fine merinos having problems of a wall break at that time. Um, crazy running disease relates to issues of too much ammonia, rumen ammonia in their system, and I'll come back onto that shortly because that can actually, at the extreme, I've never come across it in New Zealand, but under those conditions, they can sometimes see some degree of neurological um, things going a little bit crazy. So crazy running disease, there you go. That's today's unusual topic. So post break, the way that they've learned to manage it is to consider, um, even though you have grass growing, to consider using your subdivided areas to hold stock in relatively smaller areas to stop, 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 stop wandering, chasing green pick and ironically continue to feed supplementary feeds and allow pastures to accumulate more mass in front of stock uh, so that we don't have them walking over big paddocks, particularly if you don't have a lot of subdivision at your place. Um, 
And therefore, when they do go out onto pasture, they can walk less and, and walk less both in terms of grazing to find feed um, and actual uh, walking around to get some water in it um, and eat more per every mouthful of feed. And I'll come back to that. As well as when you're looking to uh, have some sustainability of the perenniality of your pastures by allowing more pasture mass to accumulate in front of you um, post-autumn break. It's good for the animal, stops that running around eating very little for, for a lot of walking, but it also favours the survival of your perennial pasture species. Post-autumn break, your grasses are waking up, so to speak, with that green drought phase we get to, just a green fuzz of a little bit of regrowth coming through. All of that has been punched out of the root reserves of your perennial pasture species. If we allow crazy running to graze over the top of that, you will um, exhaust the root reserves on your perennial species and persistence will become more of a problem. Another of my crazy uh, mind maps. When we have our autumn post break pasture, compared to summer pasture, there's a whole lot of different nutritional stuff happening here. On average, the dry matter percent is much lower. In other words, there's much more water per bite, higher crude protein. The protein that is there is more room and degradable, which is broken down more extensively and quickly to ammonia in the rumen. And, and hold that thought, we're going to come back to that in a moment. On average, it's lower fibre. And so obviously the faecal consistency of your stock will change. Uh, notable in, in both sheep and cattle, particularly in beef, um, that will start to get the squirts. Um, higher uh, NDFD means digestibility of fibre. So it breaks down more quickly and extensively in the rumen. We get more sugars, higher water soluble carbohydrates. That's these guys here. And then coming um, onto this aspect that Mary's going to cover for us soon, is that we have both increasing demands um, and supply of minerals and vitamins. Everything changes from what's been happening over the summer. So we go from um, what was on the left might be just a tiny bit of green pick or no green pick, and all of a sudden we're in the land of milk and honey once again. But when this happens abruptly, we do have quite a change that um, can potentially affect our animals. And in theory, the feed on the right should be even 12 ME per kilograms of dry matter, lambs should be flying uh, or cattle should be flying. But in many cases, despite on paper, this looking a good feed, it doesn't always translate to what the animal needs. Not for the first two, perhaps three weeks or even sometimes a bit longer before their, their rumen and other parts of the gastrointestinal tract are capable of both digesting and utilising this new type of feed. So there's no numbers wrapped around here intentionally because each and every one of you, this will vary. And particularly this year where a lot of you have had better summers than average and the summer pasture has actually been quite good quality. So the magnitude or quantum of change from summer to autumn won't be as profound as it would be in a very dry year. But as I mentioned, those mind map, those, um, those blue factors on, on the previous slide, you know, summer we may be moderate to high uh, going to low to moderate dry matter, uh, energy, it might be low energy that suddenly goes to high digestibility, which is the same as energy in a nutshell, but again, um, low to high protein. And this is a point I'm going to come on to because I know a lot of you will be interested in the protein story. We may go from low protein, depending on the percentage of legumes in your summer uh, pastures, through to moderate or even very high. And then we go to quite low fibre and that's um, contributing to the sloppier dung. Uh, the sloppy dung quite often the autumn does just simply come from the low dry matter percent. We get higher fecal moisture as well. And sugars again from um, low through to higher. And depending on how we go for time with our timekeepers keeping an eye on us, um, the tastiness can change through this time, particularly when you have high endophyte, um, a lot of seed head and not much legume. And all of a sudden we've got a very tasty potential pasture, but sometimes autumn pasture isn't always tasty. We'll cover that depending on how we have time to share that one. So it's quite a busy place inside the guts of the animal and the paunch and the intestines, everything's having to adjust to sudden changes in this diet as we shift from summer to autumn pasture. Again, the magnitude of change varies from year to year. So let's look at the firstly, what's the impact of low dry matter percent of autumn um, pastures post break? Well, the first thing is you may note that they're not drinking as 
much um, from your, your subdivided and stock water supplied pastures that you're very proud of and well done for subdividing and getting stock water in there, but damn it, they've stopped drinking. Well, it's because they're eating a lot of water with this feed. Um, we can see a lower intake of dry matter on very wet feed. And there's, there's two mechanisms, which I'll put one aside and then come on to the second mechanism. Sounds crazy, but the researchers over the years have inserted balloons into the rumens uh, of ruminant species and filled the rumens up with water. So in other words, trying to mimic what a lot of water in the rumen might do. And yes, when you do that, um, you do reduce dry matter intake because the capacity of the rumen is reduced. But in the real world where we don't have balloons in the room and rather just a lot of water slopping around, we don't believe that that slopping around of water is going to reduce dry matter intake because there's no more fit for food. Because actually the third stomach, the omasum, and the large intestine and the cecum are very clever at quickly resorbing that water. So we don't believe a sloppy gut full of water reduces dry matter intake. Rather, this is the second part, and it makes sense to all of you, I'm sure, is that when we have a lot of water and not much dry matter in every bite that our sheep and cattle are taking, is that every mouthful that can, is eaten takes less dry matter in at a low dry matter percent. So to, to reach our, our heady expectations of high performance, and let's say, okay, quite a small lamb as an example, but let's say 34 or 35 kilo lamb requires to, to eat 1.5, 1.6 kilograms dry matter of feed, um, noting that's eaten, not offered, that's after allowing for wastage. Uh, hey, wow, let's put a silly number on, but it's not silly for some feeds, 9% dry matter. That's almost 17 kilos wet weight that that lamb's got to consume. So if we combine that with a very low uh, pasture mass, so every bite's not taking a lot of feed in, it's little wonder that these lambs won't perform as well as they can. That said, some feeds such as chicory, can be as low as 8% or even 7% dry matter, and yet lambs fly on chicory despite that high dry matter, uh, sorry, the low dry matter, high water content. It could be that chicory, because chicory is a very upright plant, the lamb can still take very large mouthfuls and can compensate therefore. So the key around low dry matter percent is to make sure that there's sufficient pasture mass that stock can get a decent mouthful of feed. So again, not chasing that green pick when the, the, the pre and post grazing residuals are very low. So we so want Charlotte, higher. Mm. Sorry, just on, on that, just while you're there, we just had a question come through from mm. Renee. Yes. Does high, so. does high dry matter slash protein grain supplement have a place when pasture is very low in dry matter or is it a higher dry matter that is needed? Uh, look, that's a good question, Renee. Um, potentially, and obviously having a higher dry matter feed when you have autumn um, pasture and full flight and potentially very soft, it obviously has the other benefit that we get the effect called substitution, that when they eat something higher dry matter, they eat less pasture. So that can speed up your ability to build pasture mass in front of you. So that's about holding them back and continuing supplements. I think probably the ideal is to and particularly for those of you in more extensive systems where you're not keen on feeding out, um, would be to allow the pre-grazing mass to accumulate as much as you can so that they get the depth of every bite consuming enough feed. I think that's probably the first take-home advice rather than necessarily pushing people into a higher input system to fix the dry matter problem. Um, it's a good question, but all I'd ask is don't have a low dry matter pasture combined with a low pasture mass that's limiting their ability. Um, cattle particularly, they don't necessarily compensate well with eating more bites per day when feed's short, but lambs do have an ability to potentially compensate to some degree by taking more bites per day. But I think it's about holding stock off these pastures and waiting for a high enough mass that the bite into the sward takes as big a mouthful as you can to somewhat offset this challenge. Just ask again, Renee, if I haven't been clear enough there. Thanks, Garth. I'm leaving behind the dry matter percent story, but again, we can come back at questions if we have time at the end. What about the crude protein? I know this comes and goes from year to year as a concern, not only for young stock in the autumn or at all parts of the year, to be fair. Um, also, um, the concern around potentially tupping for ewes and other stock classes. With regard to young stock particularly, not leaving behind the other stock classes, if animals suddenly change from a very low protein, dry summer pasture 
on to a high protein feed. So this isn't limited to summer autumn pasture change, but also perhaps lambs. They may be big singles coming off the hill, not quite ready to kill straight off mum. You might drop them on lucerne, which this isn't necessarily a good idea, a large single that's only two or three kilos away dropping onto lucerne. But that sudden dietary change that can also happen shifting from dry summer pasture to autumn lush pasture is we get that sudden burst of rapidly rumen degradable protein being converted into rumen ammonia. And it overwhelms the rumen microbes ability to convert it into nice microbial protein. Rather, we end up with high levels of rumen ammonia. And what that can do is cause a low dry matter intake or DMI. It's a negative feedback loop, essentially a high uh, flush of, of rumen and therefore blood ammonia makes them go, oh, don't feel quite so good, thanks very much. I'm not going to eat quite as much of that feed, thanks very much. And that can suppress appetite until such, such stage as the rumen uh, gradually over a period of days or sometimes two to three weeks changes the types of microbes present that are more able to take all of that surplus protein and more effectively to convert it into microbial protein that then is available for doing more useful things like lean tissue growth in the case of say hoggets and um, wiener calves. So they can show by simply standing still for a number of weeks and yet that lovely graph we had up before said Ooh, 12 ME lucerne or 12 ME or even 13 ME autumn grass says they should be doing 300 a day on lambs. Why are they not? This is, this is one, one of the mechanisms that may contribute. Over a period of time, the rumen adjusts, as mentioned, and other parts of the tract of the gut will also adjust, including, um, you know, Mary and other vets on here, you'll laugh at second year biochemistry at vet school, we learned about all the enzymes of the urea cycle. And what the urea cycle in the liver does is convert all that ammonia into urea that becomes urinary urea that's excreted at the back end. The poor old liver over the summer gets a bit lazy and doesn't have a lot of the necessary enzymes for urea cycle activity. And when we shift on to uh, very high protein feeds, it takes time um, to suddenly lift the urea cycle capacity to detoxify ammonia into urea. So this is about taking time and careful transition to get them from a low protein to a high protein feed. So through this time, we'll come on to internal parasites, probably going too slow, we may not come on to internal parasites, but sometimes the, we get what's loosely, pardon the pun, loosely called a protein scour. We don't entirely know if this is true dietary protein overload or ammonia toxicity or whatever, but it may be simply um, the anosmotic effect, which means a lot of protein in the intestine, small intestine particularly, is drawing in fluid from, um, from tissues and is contributing to a high, higher fecal moisture and dragging more of a scour through. It may just be the dark green colour is all the chlorophyll breakdown products from that green grass, and that's it almost goes black, um, but probably high moisture faeces from the fact that these low dry matter percent. So again, it's not always protein and we'll come back to internal parasites if we have time. So in time, the rumen and the liver will adjust to autumn pasture. For those of you that are more in summer safe areas or have had a kinder summer this year, especially more recently, and you've got a lot of green pick around on, on your summer pastures, and yet we do have, I think, some southerly weather coming through next week where we are, many of us are gonna get rain. You may get no transition gut transition this year because you already have a lot of green pick in your summer feed versus other years you'll recall we just had tag and thatch and not a lot of green material. In years where you feel you may have a sudden transition ironically and it seems crazy when you've just had autumn rain and you're desperate to stop feeding out and preserve what supplements you have on hand for winter ironically you may be advised to continue to offer some baleage or hay um, to stock just to help um, transition the guts including the rumen and the liver, across to this very, very high quality feed. Obviously not useful if you feed hay and you've got lambs slash hoggets and they go, oh, it's going to sleep on this. I've never seen this before. So it depends on if they know what it is, of course, and, and just the palatability and quality of that. Or, and again, I'm sounding like a broken record here, we wait for some higher pasture mass to accumulate in your autumn pastures if you've come out of a very dry summer and wait to reach high grazing mass higher pre-grazing mass, um, both higher dry matter percent with it being a bit higher, the protein will be less room and degradable and there'll be more sugars or water-soluble carbohydrates. So more of a balanced diet 
having a higher pre-graze mass than having that short pick that they run around. So the, th the themes are the same, it's just I guess I'm backgrounding it from a different angle. Moving on to animal health, I think we've got about seven minutes, um, Garth and others, so you can tell me to shut up when we're, when we're there. I'm not going to run into Mary's time. And I'm going to move through this reasonably quickly because um, I'm assuming that almost everyone, if not everyone here, knows all about internal parasites. And Mary, you can roll your eyes. Oh, my gosh. This, this diagram also has been around since I think when I was at vet school, and I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but it was a bloody long time ago. Um, but those of you quite sincerely with a level, an internal level of interest in internal parasites that it's an area you haven't dabbled on, I'd strongly advise you go to the Beef and Lamb website and, and haul off the Wormwise resource book. She's a goodie. I've unashamedly pinched this diagram from here because it explains very elegantly what happens in the autumn coming out of a dry summer. So where internal parasites come from, uh, this is a very basic explanation, is the third stage or L3 larvae from internal parasites that hatch out of eggs, um, L1, L2, and then the L3s are the wrigglers, um, the one that are very, ones that are very mobile and climb up your pastures, ready, saying, eat me, eat me to the stock. And the numbers can go down relatively low in the summer, again, depending on how much summer moisture is around, how they can survive in dung pats. And then when we get the flush of lovely moisture for Africa, all of a sudden moisture helps them crawl up the pasture, the blades of your grasses, and um, essentially present themselves to be consumed. And away goes your burst of intestinal parasitism in the autumn. Those of you that have had a better summer may find that there hasn't been the traditional summer dip in your area and L3 challenge may have been a problem right the way through. So please defer to your, to your local vets um, to discuss this further. This is just a generalisation. So in terms of autumn ill thrift, what's the internal parasites role? Well, it can be a biggie for young stock particularly. Uh, when It's not necessarily due to the parasites destroying the gut lining, although certainly they can destroy the, the gut lining. The main thing that happens to feed conversion efficiency is your young stock's immune system going a little bit crazy lots of crazies in this presentation, eh? The immune system goes a bit wild and that causes um, some of the reduction in dry matter intake, their desire to eat stuff. So that can be as little as 15, well, it's still not little, is it? 15 to 20% drop in their dry matter intake uh, with subclinical internal parasitism through to full noise clinical parasitism. They look thin as a rake, uh, dags for Africa down uh, the backs of the legs, scouring um, cattle crapping through the eye of a needle where they have no desire to eat at all. So, and there's obviously a, a spectrum between those two. As well as that, and particularly for young growing animals who have a high requirement for protein to build uh, both lean tissue and bones who are still actively growing, they're in the teenage phase of their life, uh, we still have those animals absorbing um, dietary protein and microbial protein that flows from the rumen, but they can have the reverse flow of blood proteins leaking from, um, from the blood supply back into the intestines, which is just a shambles in terms of a genuine protein loss. Uh, as well as that, uh, we may have redu a reduction of uh, protein manufacture by the gut from the liver, and that contributes to automill thrift. So very much an internal parasite uh, issue. So if you're blaming all of your automobile thrift on just one thing, low dry matter percent in pastures, um, blah, 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 that initial mind map dump, remember that um, parasites under, behind underfeeding, I think internal parasites deserve for young stock to be second cab off the rank as likelihood of automobile thrift. And please do talk to your vet for more information about that. As well as that, your vet and or farm consultant and or beef and lamb representative can give you some, some basic discussion points and there's some good resources both in the Wormwise um, book but also there's other um, fact sheets on beef and lamb's website as well uh, about autumn, avoiding autumn grazing with young stock um, on lambing and weaning blocks where the L3 challenges are probably higher. Oh, here I go again. It's the Charlotte take home from today. Accumulate more pasture mass before grazing. I've got a diagram to explain that. The higher pasture mass and higher post-grazing residuals, the less the intake of L3s. Um, unimproved pastures, so you've got a lot of brown top type pastures, they will host more L3 larvae than improved pastures. 
we'll come on to that shortly. Um, and potentially with short rotations, we're talking about annual and Italian ryegrasses and tetrapleoid ryegrasses that tend to be a little bit more upright and, and less tiller dense. Um, they support fewer L3s just because the sward is more open and not as nice to hold moisture for L3s to wriggle around in. And then not to graze to low um, post-grazing residuals. So essentially when we say that, and this is worm-wise, so go back to that resource. This diagram has been around since the 70s. And no, I wasn't at vet school in the 70s. I'm not that old. Um, is that when you graze low into the pasture sward, uh, most of the L3s are in the um, bottom of that sward. Um, finishing up on internal parasites. Goodness, my phone's going. Everything's happening here. Um, this is some, some older work from 1995, just showing the, the differences in L3 load on different types of feeds and looking at chicory, lucerne, uh, brassicas wasn't part of the work, but that in autumn there can be alternative crop species to greatly reduce the L3 challenge to your stock. We've covered that anyway. It's there if anyone wants to pause a recording and read that. Work with your vet is my, my key take home here. We're going to skim through this because I've got two more minutes to go. Facial eczema more relevant the further north we go, but please, we must remember with facial eczema that subclinical and certainly clinical facial eczema damage is not about the skin damage, it's about the liver damage. The liver is incredibly important uh, for nutrient repackaging and processing to ensure good feed conversion efficiency. So again, keep out of the base of the sward. That's where the spores live. Don't graze low into the sward. Exactly the same advice as internal parasites. And talk to your vet uh, with regard to requirements for zinc, zinc capsules, boluses, uh, where and if required, and spore counting if you are in a hot zone to understand risk well before it arrives. Alkaloids, if you have older pastures, wild or standard type ryegrass endophytes, there are many alkaloids associated with the wild or standard type endophytes, a couple of which are associated with reduced feed conversion efficiency. Uh, ryegrass staggers doesn't in its own right cause um, reduced feed conversion efficiency, but if they're staggering, clearly they don't eat enough and they go backwards. Ergovalin increases risk of heat stress, reduced dry matter intake, don't do well. And a couple of the other endophyte alkaloids actually increase uh, fecal moisture, so increase risk of dags and scarring. So risk factors are a lot of seed heads and tag, grazing low under the sward. Oh, geez, there I go again. And watch out because with wild or the older standard type um, ryegrass endophytes, the short green pick that comes through in the autumn can quite often contain a lot of the endophyte alkaloids. Uh, so that short green pick can be a problem. So the novel endophytes, the majority of novel endophytes available in modern ryegrasses uh, don't have these issues. Uh, and you can talk to your vet and to your rural reseller about uh, identifying and potentially choosing some regrassing options to reduce the risks. Uh, mycotoxins, really briefly, there's a hodgepodge of mycotoxins um, in autumn pasture, particularly post rains where you have the thatch still present from the summer, and it's a lovely place. So when you're seeing facial eczema, when you're seeing mushrooms, and you've got quite a, a thatch at the base of your sward, there's a good chance you've got some weird stuff, of which not all of them have been reported in New Zealand. Predominantly, they are a number of different species um, of fusaria or fusarium singular, including deoxynivalanol, nivalanol and xerulinone. So the first two, Don and, and Niv, um, they can cause liver and kidney damage and a lot of non-specific thrift signs. And the further north we go into warmer areas, xerulinone is estrogenic and it can even make weathers grow little tiny teats and a little udder on them, which is just freaky. So hard, not well studied. There is um, a little bit of work um, that beef and lamb you have got on your website. So if you Google that, um, how to avoid it? Don't graze low into the sward. Oh my, I might as well just quit now and say that's a take home. But last slide, people. Um, Mary, I'm not going to steal your, your time. Psychogenic regulation. That's a stupid word to finish on because you have heads and hands saying, you, you know, what does that mean? Another cause of ill thrift is if the animals don't want to eat your lovely stuff you've prepared for them. Let's pick on lambs. Lambs, if we've got lambs going into the other extreme of 
3,500 pasture mass that's beyond their brick grazing horizon. They don't like to eat it. We all know this stuff. Look, bugger the scientists. You, you guys know this stuff. Tetraploid and diploid ryegrasses, they love tetraploids, tasty tetraploids. So those of you in more, your better country, um, finishing flats, um, you know, going for a tetraploid type of grass can improve uh, the consumption of those uh, higher sugar. Higher sugar grasses don't always express the high sugar tendency, um, and especially in, in this part of the world where people are watching today. Wild type endophytes don't taste good. Uh, another reason to go to novel types, the wild ones just taste foul. Um, very high applications of sulfur, very high applications of K, and the accumulation of nitrate in autumn pastures can reduce intake of feed. So, it's, Mary, I'm not sure if you're talking nitrates, but that can act like uh, accumulation of rumen ammonia and make them not want to eat. Picture on the right, leaf rust, um, depending on where you are with summer, late summer, leaf rust can still be a problem, won't cause animal health problems. Um, the two types of rust that we see on our pastures. But who wants to eat that orange stuff? Ugh. And then, of course, we all know what they do around stock camps. I'm going to be quiet now. And um, sorry, we've, we've run a couple of minutes over time for questions, um, Garth and the team. But um, just finishing up, there's lots of stuff going on. Work through one by one. Get some health, if in doubt. Good luck. And thank you. Look, thank you very much, Charlotte. Um... Yeah, I'm not sure I prefer my clock and it's you've got you finishing right on time. So thank you very much for that. Just before before you put your microphone on mute, um, just had one question that's come through um, before you go. Can you see L3 larvae on grass blades? I wish we could, but we can't. So they are most certainly there, but very hard to see with a naked eye, especially no. someone old like me with an I'm half blind. Any comments on that, Mary? You can unmute. Certainly in a scientific, like that, that 1995 scientific paper, they certainly did counts um, under the microscope. But comments, Mary? I'd rather look for them in the guts. Um, no, you can't, can't see the, the larvae on, on the grass. So yeah, definitely needs the microscope. 